everyone, Rob Greenfield here and today we're going to talk about some bigger picture things. Money, health insurance, age, death, and how these are a part of my life, what I'm doing. A lot of people ask this, it's one of the most common themes of questions because I've designed my life in a different way. I mean there's no doubt that the way that I'm living is not typical in the society that I live here in the United States. So it's, it's of course I'm going to have questions of those bigger picture things and I want to share those things with you. Now I have put countless hours of thought into these topics, into money and how it's involved in my life, into health and ultimately the question of health insurance, into what I'm going to do when I'm older, I'm 33 years old now, and the thought of death. These are, these are central parts of our life and I have put so many hours of thought into them. In fact, almost everything that I do is very much designed through many hours of thought, through much practice, and through you know, just general consciousness, deciding to live in the way that I want. Now my life is designed around living in a way that's beneficial to the earth, my community, and myself. So that's the central theme you're going to see running through all of this. I've designed my life to try to live in a way where I'm imparting goodness into the world and not destruction. Giving, giving back, giving to, without taking. And so that's really the design. So to start with, I'm going to go into money a little bit first. I've committed to living below the federal poverty threshold. What I, what I mean is making less per year than what is considered the federal poverty threshold. Now, I am not trying to simulate poverty. That's not what I'm doing at all. For me, what that is, is it's a way to, to create a measure to make less than that per year, to keep my life not focused on money and only make the money that I need. So currently in 2019, the federal poverty threshold for an individual is about $12,000. So my lifetime commitment is to live, to make less per year than the federal poverty threshold, which changes from year to year. Now, at the same time, I've made a lifetime commitment to donating 100% of my media earnings directly to nonprofits, not be paid any, but to have it instead donated directly to nonprofits. So it says in my contracts with TV, with books, that I'm not being paid. They're making a donation to environmental nonprofits. Now, you know, some people look at my life and think that I'm not contributing. By deciding to earn minimal money, then I'm not contributing. And one of the big ones is taxes. And I've intentionally made a commitment to not pay federal taxes. And the reason why is because I do not support war and a huge percentage of our taxes go into war. They go into the destruction of our planet. So the thing about our tax system is it's not a just system. It's not an equal system and it's causing destruction to the world. And I'm not going to put money there. There, That's something that I decided. But what I have done is I've given myself basically a 100% tax. 100% of media income goes directly to nonprofits. Those are underfunded things in our society that need more, that benefit our society as a whole. So I choose nonprofits that really are working at benefiting people, especially benefiting people that are underserved that those taxes are not being, you know, that are being disproportionately sent around and not being sent to the underserved people. And of course the underserved species. So that's the idea is not paying into what I don't support and paying into what I really support and what is beneficial to the bigger picture. Now because I've committed to that, that means that I am not paying into social security. 
So because of that, I've made a commitment to not withdraw from Social, Secu Social Security. My goal through this is always to be fair, to be honest. And it's easy for people who might not believe in what I'm doing to just make these assumptions like, oh, well, he's going to take Social Security or he's just going to mooch off the system. But I, again, have thought this out very deeply. So I've decided that I will not take from Social Security if Social Security even exists in the future when I would be eligible for it but not taking from Social Security. And then the other big thing is health insurance. I do not have health insurance, and because I don't work a job that provides it, or I don't earn enough money to pay for it, what that means is I don't have health insurance. Now, I do qualify for free health insurance because I make less than the federal poverty threshold, but I'm not taking it because I'm not paying into it. With that being said, I'll talk more about health insurance uh, later on in this, in this video. Continuing on with money, the question that many people have is, how do I make money? How do I earn a living? And so I do that through public speaking. And this year, 2019, I earned, I think it was $9,760, and that's all I'll earn for the year. Last year, in 2018, it was $8,000, and in 2017, it was $5,000, I believe. Now, I list all of this on my website. I practice transparency, and I have links to all of these resources that are on my website in the description of this video, so you can click through and you can go a lot further and learn a lot more. Now, for me, I have decided that I won't earn money in a way that's causing destruction to the world or stands against my beliefs. So that's why I love the fact that I could make the little bit of money that I need through public speaking because I'm actually sharing my message. And it's something that I love. Speaking is my passion and I would do it for free and I do do it for free. In fact, most of my public speaking is done for free, uh, whether it's at libraries or for nonprofits. I charge for a handful or so of my talks per year, and most of them are actually done for free. So that's the way that I'm able to earn the you know minimal amount of money that I need in order to in order to to live and live comfortably. I definitely do have a desire to live with a reasonable level of comfort, not over comfort but enough comfort to be able to live my life and, and do the things that I'm trying to do to, to make the impact that I'm trying to make. So I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, what I don't have in order to be able to do this. And there's a lot of things that I don't have. Over the last eight years, I've been drastically simplifying my life. So I don't have a bank account, no debit card or credit card and no online financial accounts at all. I had PayPal, but I got rid of that recently. So I deal with cash. Um, cash is the way that I, that, I, that I primarily deal with money. When I am paid for public speaking, it's a check, and then I cash that check, uh, or a money order, and then I cash that money order. In order to live simply, I also have no monthly bills. Now I can do that, because I've simplified my life. I used to have dozens of bills, as long with dozen, uh, you know, half a dozen credit cards and all of that, I had that, but I've been simplifying my life over eight years. So I have no bills, I have no cell phone, I got rid of that in around 2015, four or five years ago. I use Wi-Fi instead. I have no car. I got rid of my car in about 2012-ish, so I think that was seven years ago. So no insurance, registration, maintenance. The average American is spending $7,000 per year on their vehicle, is the statistics I've read online. So that's $7,000 a year that I don't need by not having a car. Along with that, I also have no mortgage because I don't own a house. I practice non-ownership. And I also don't have monthly rent. Instead, I do work exchanges, which I'll get into that a, a little more in a little bit. 
I also have no investments. In the past, uh, when I was in my late teens and early 20s, I worked really hard. I actually was working 80 hours a week selling educational books door to door, and I was making a good amount of money. And then, and, and so at the time, I was maxing out my Roth IRA and I had life insurance for the financial investment of it. But I divested from all of that for multiple reasons. One, I researched where I was invested. I was invested in cigarettes, I was invested in fossil fuels, I was invested in all sorts of things that I didn't support. So I took my money out of all that. And the other thing was I wanted to live for now. I think we're in a time where we need to put in the resources now for humanity, for other species, and for the earth. I'm not saving the money for when I'm 60, or when I'm 70, or when I'm 80. I don't even know if the earth, the, as we know it, the earth will exist, but humanity as we know it will exist 50 years from now. I'm using my life now to bring up the people around me and to benefit humanity. That's why I don't have a personal savings, because I think I can use that money better for the global community. It's not about me and saving my life. It's about the life that exists today that's just as meaningful as my own. I also have no debt. I had debt before I was on this path, but I decided that that's not something that I wanted to have anymore, so I worked it off. I paid the debt I had off, and I have no debt, and I don't intend to accrue any debt. In fact, I don't even have a a credit score anymore. I looked it up because I have no credit cards or anything like that. I have no credit score. I've designed that intentionally because I don't want to be able to access those things. So I, I didn't destroy my credit, I just let it actually disappear. So, but that's intentional. I don't want to be able to re-enter. I've made it actually challenging for me to re-enter because you can easily, quickly do that thing. I've also chosen a life of primarily non-ownership. I've chosen not to own a house because the reality is, is that there's millions of houses out there that are empty or practically empty. The resources already exist. I don't need to own a house of my own. So you've seen some of the things that I've done. I've lived in two tiny houses, um, both of which I ended up donating afterwards. The first one in San Diego, I raised funds to build houses for people without homes by auctioning it off, auctioning it off. And then the second one in Orlando, I gave to a community where it will be used for their um, eco-volunteering program. So I've chosen a life of non-ownership because I believe in sharing resources. I think that's something that we need more of today of communal resources. It's something that we've lost so much of over the last generations, this idea that we can just work together and share. Generally, I don't believe in the idea of ownership much at all. I don't believe that we can own the land. I think that's overall a delusion of the human experience. This earth exists with or without us. We do not own this land. And even owning a house, for most people that own a house, they have a mortgage and who really owns it is the bank. If they don't pay that, those uh, bills, um, if they get sick and they're not able to pay, a lot of times that's not their house anymore. And there's a lot of delusion in, in this. You have people that, that think that they're secure. You have the 2009 or so housing market and crash and a million people lose their house that they thought they owned. So personally, I've chosen a life that is largely of non-ownership. And that means I have very few possessions as well. And so by choosing to have few possessions, that's another way that I need a lot less money because I'm, I work much more with the earth, you could say, than the average person. I do believe that the earth can provide for our basic needs in many ways. So that's a, you know, a part of the bigger picture on non-ownership and how that fits into money, needing less money because I don't choose to own things. I also choose very much to work with my community. I believe that we live in a time where most of the resources are, are there. We have the knowledge and the expertise and we have many of the resources to work with our community and not have to depend on corporations and not need to be sending our money outside of our community. So one way that I do that is through work exchanges. 
My tiny houses have both been set up in someone's unused backyard that they weren't benefiting from. In exchange for me setting up my tiny house and living there, I improved their land. Um, in Orlando, I turned the whole front yard into a garden, helped uh, the woman live more sustainably, which is something that she had been trying to do for two and a half decades. So not paying rent, my rent was my work. So in exchange with other people. I do work exchanges for many things. Um, to have my yoga membership, I built them a garden and managed it. And I also started a composting program where I would pick up their compost. These were things that they wanted and I was able to provide to them uh, to benefit one another. Last year I had a filling that fell out and it would have cost about two or three hundred dollars and at the time I had less than a thousand I believe. So it wasn't money that I wanted to spend. So instead I found a dentist where I could do an exchange and I actually used one of my old skills or still a current skill, social media um, and, and marketing which isn't something I use a lot today but still know that. And so I, did, I helped them with their website and I helped them with their social media in exchange for filling that, uh, cap, that, that cavity and um, just to overall a, a checkup. So there's so many ways that we can exchange with each other without money and that is largely the way that I live with far less money. It's just through exchanging and, and it's always about how can we be mutually beneficial. How can we share resources, how can we share our time to, to ultimately be much more part of our community and, and, and work together. Now, one of the most common things is people asking about, well, what about having a family? And what about getting married? And I've chosen a, a different path in that way than a lot of people would. I've personally chosen not to have children. Uh, when I was 25, I got a vasectomy and I'm 33 year now, years old now, so that was eight years ago. And I did that for many reasons, but one of them was that I decided that I wasn't going to have children. I believe that the earth has a lot of children on it that could really use my time and energy. I don't need to have, I don't need to create life to leave a legacy. Like, you know, that's some people, that's how they feel like they want to leave their legacy. That's not something for me. I'd rather spend my time speaking at schools or volunteering with children or, you know, working with nonprofits that are uplifting children in need. To sum it up, there's enough children in need out there and that's where I've decided to put my time into rather than having my own. And then as far as marriage, I do not intend to ever get married and the reason why is that the government doesn't need to be involved in my love. My love has nothing to do with paper and it has nothing to do with contracts. I may be with someone for the rest of my life and I may not, but regardless, no contract has to be done on that behalf. So because I've chosen a life of not having people that are dependent upon me, that is one of the main factors in me being able to live this way. It's important to keep in mind that I've designed my life for my life. I have not designed my life for other people to live it. Everybody has to choose to live their own life and with what I'm sharing today and what I'm sharing in my life, there may be some things that you take from it that you can adapt that can really add value to your life and help you live in a way that's you know, more in alignment with your beliefs and in service to the world. That's the idea. You can take from it what you can use. So, you know, my, a lot of people look at me and they say, this is only possible because of this or that. And that is because this life is possible because it is my life and I'm designing it that way. So everything that I do is not designed for a family of five that has different needs. It's designed to be a message. My life is my message and in many ways it is extreme. I've designed it to be extreme as a, largely as a wake-up call, as a way to get people thinking about their relationship with money, their relationship with the earth. So I do things in an extreme way to shock people, to, to get them outside of their comfort zone, but not to live just like me. Again, to take the lessons that they can and use them for good. So that's really what that's about. 
a little bit more about money because a lot of people want to know some of the details such as how do I buy things and and you know what do I spend money on and things like that so how I'm living without a credit card and a bank account is that I try to shop local as much as I can buy things locally and then primarily buying used things my goal is to buy used as much as I can so that could include thrift shops when I built my tiny house that was out of 99% secondhand materials so buying used things locally that I can generally do with cash now I do some transactions online and because I don't have accounts what I can do is I can have someone else purchase it and then I pay them cash that's an example of sharing I don't need to have a credit card to use it a f few times per year which would change everything having that I I have no problem uh, giving someone cash for them to purchase something in my ideal world I would not purchase anything online ever but I'm not living my ideal world I'm trying I'm doing you know a great job of living the way that I'm that I'm that I'm trying to live with my actions in alignment with my beliefs but it's not perfect so so I do some online transactions for sure but uh, that's the way that I that I manage that as far as expenses what I actually do spend money on that really does vary for example right now I'm in the project of growing and foraging hundred percent of my food for a year which means I'm not buying any food food is actually one of my main expenses generally but I also do a lot of dumpster diving we throw away billions of dollars of the perfectly good food uh, at grocery stores and, and everywhere really so I take that perfectly good food and I eat it it's a way of non monetized food eating in an environmentally friendly way so there are that's two ways growing and foraging hundred percent of my food for a year meant no spending money on food and then dumpster diving for food is a way that I've gotten a lot of my food over the last six years but with that being said I do a lot of traveling and food is food is life it's one of the most important things to me so that is one of my main expenses my expenses vary from time to time sometimes it's travel um, sometimes it's some new possessions whether it's clothes or possibly a backpack during this year of growing and foraging all my food I did buy items for food like a, f uh, you know, a blender and a dehydrator and things like that building my tiny house that cost about fifteen hundred dollars so that was an expense so my expenses really do vary it's hard to sum it up there there's different ones um, but that's a bit of an idea of what I spend money on now again as I've said many times the goal is to live in the service of others and one of the ways that I do that is through my nonprofit work I had a nonprofit called happy healthy and free from around 2000 14 to 2019 I just dissolved it this year and I dissolved it to live more simply again my name was on that bank account and it was one way that I was involved with money and instead I've decided to partner with other nonprofits I can work with different nonprofits and get the things accomplished that I want to without having to have a nonprofit of my own so some of the programs that I currently have are Gardens for the people where we build gardens for uh, for people that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford or create them uh, we have a Free seed project and I've sent out 5,000 Free seed packs to help people all across the country to be able to grow their own organic healthy food and then community fruit trees where we've planted over 200 fruit trees to in public places where it won't be monetized it's just people picking delicious and nutritious food that's growing abundantly around them on the streets in front yards next to the sidewalk churchyards schools wherever they're accessible to the public so this all does take money and I do that through partnerships so the main um, nonprofit that I work with right now is live like alley foundation and I do these programs with them in partnership with them and they are the ones that have the money to be able to do them so again it's all about partnerships it's all about working together my life although I personally have very little money money is still involved and so my goal is to use money as a tool for positive change and not a tool for destruction 
So it's a whole different way of looking at money from what a lot of us have thought about it and, and for me, even for the first two thirds of my life. So I can't explain it all in this one video. It's complex, you know, there's the saying, money makes the world go round. It doesn't, the world goes around without money. But the saying exists because it seems that way with everything being monetized. So because most of our actions today are monetized, to unravel that is more than really I can explain in this one video or even in a day of sitting down. But I'm able to sum this up and give you an idea but you have to go deeper. It's, it's all a lot deeper than just what I'm able to explain here, but this does give you a pretty good foundation of why I'm doing things this way with money and, and how to. A central necessity to all of this is transparency. Transparency is what's lacking so much in our, in our government, in our politics, in our corporations, and simply, if transparency existed in those areas, we'd be living in a different world. So for me, I lead by example and practice transparency. So this information is on my website, where my money is, where the money's coming from, where it's going, uh, all, all these things. So my website has a lot more with transparency and I'll continue to update that throughout time. So let's talk a little bit about health insurance now. That is absolutely one of the most frequently asked questions. When it comes to not having much money, what about health insurance? And it's a totally understandable question because it's, it's, it's a very central part of our current society. So what I wanna do though is zoom back a little bit. One of the important things if you're looking at my work and you're trying to understand the way that I'm thinking is that I zoom way out and look at the bigger picture. A lot of the way we think today is very much designed based on our society, our singular society, when there's hundreds of societies, there's 200 countries out there, there's many different ways of doing things. But most people around me look at things through their lens, their society. And at the same time, they're looking at life through the lens of this time. Now, I've chosen not to design my life surely based on the present time and the present society that I'm in. It does, you don't have to do that. Just because you're born in a place and time doesn't mean that you have to adhere to that place and time. Health insurance in the United States is a part of this place and this time. And I've chosen not to just blindly buy into that system. If you look at the bigger picture, humans have existed for 99.999% of, exist, of their existence without health insurance. It's a blink of time on the map of humanity. It's not absolute. It's not something that is absolutely needed to exist. It's just, just that's a pretty basic thing. So I'm looking at things through the basics. So the other part of health insurance is that it's a system that I do not support in many ways. A lot of our healthcare is highly destructive. What we do is we take from other areas, we take from other cultures that we don't look upon as high as ourselves in order, to, in order for our own health. And that's not something that I support. There's so much destruction in our healthcare system. And then the other thing is there's so much recklessness. People might think that what I'm doing is reckless, but what I see as reckless is, is smoking cigarettes, eating fast food, not getting exercise, living in an extremely stressful and anxious way, not paying attention to our bodies. This is what's called preventative health care, taking care of our bodies to prevent the need for doctors in the first place and the, the health insurance. It's something like, I think over three quarters of health care visits come down to what we're eating, if we're moving our body, exercise, and then stress and anxiety. So I practice deeply preventative health care. That is the central to my health insurance. My insurance is investing in my body every single day and taking care of myself. 
So that's a, very much the center of it. Now, of course, you have bigger things that preventative health care doesn't that doesn't that can't necessarily handle getting into a car accident, breaking an arm, uh, you know, major accidents. And that's where, you know, health insurance for me would make the most sense with sort of catastrophes. So I've done a lot of research on this. For example, I looked up how much it would cost if I broke my arm. It looks like on average, maybe it would be about $5,000. I can pay for that out of pocket. If I don't have the money, I can get a bill and I can work it off. Again, I've committed to not accepting free health care because I'm not paying into that system. One thing that I would like to say with that is that I believe that health care is a basic human right. I think in an advanced society with trillions and trillions of dollars, we should be able to take care of each other. And I definitely don't believe that we should make trillions of dollars off of people's lack of health because that gives an incentive to want people to be unhealthy so that they, corporations can make money off of their lack of health. So that's another part of the bigger picture of it. So if I have things like that are more minor, like a broken arm, I can pay for that with cash, out of pocket. Um, now there's the bigger picture, the bigger things like, you know, let's say the bill would be $250,000 or $500,000. Well, the reality of our healthcare system is that it's far from flawless. A lot, of, I can't tell you the number of stories I've heard of people having that kind of bill. They have health insurance. The health insurance won't pay for all of it. And the bill is still crippling enough where it didn't matter if it was 100,000 or 500,000, they're gonna be in debt paying that for the rest of their life. So does our healthcare system work in that scenario? For a lot of people, it absolutely doesn't. So for me, the math on my personal life is that the, the math works out that it makes, it probably, almost in any scenario, is gonna make sense for me not to have health insurance just from a number standpoint. But the numbers aren't the big thing. It's the much bigger picture element of it. Now let's talk a little bit about age. That's somewhere where health insurance really would play a larger role uh, and another one of those big questions, what am I going to do when I get older? So again, we got to go back to a much bigger picture thing. Age has existed for all of humanity. I don't have to choose to age in a way that this mainstream society around me chooses to age. It's a whole, I'm, gonna, I'm going at it from a whole different base. So you have to look at other cultures and how they deal with age as well. Now, you look, at, you look at life and there are many examples of people who at the age of 60 or 70 or 80 are still healthy and are still doing a lot of what I'm doing today. Now, I'm not saying that I am, that's going to happen or that I depend on that, but there's the reality that taking care of my life now is more likely to have a healthier life as I age. So what are some of the things that I, I could do as I age? I'm not gonna live my life this way forever. I am definitely going to live my life in a way that's in service to the earth, my community, and myself, regardless of my age. But I probably won't, I, maybe I won't be living in a tiny house or biking across the United States. I'm not gonna be doing these things. There's different ways to do things. So how can age be, how can, you know, how can we age in a way that's dignified and you know, sustainable, financially sustainable as well. Couple options, one, community. So there are many communities out there that are intergenerational where people work together. There's a lot of people in our society that think because when you're older, you're, you're less important, but every human is equally important. And in an intergenerational community, elders and young, Middle age, they all have their roles. So in an intergenerational community, I could still be gardening and growing food to provide for the community. Maybe, maybe I can't be in the garden, but maybe I could be cooking. If not cooking, maybe I could be watching children. So in, you know, community is one of the big things, and that could be joining a community that already exists, or it could be creating a community. In my 
time, that is a possibility of something that I will do, is to create a community of sorts that I will grow old with, or join one uh, that already exists to, to grow old with. Now, outside of community, there's other smaller forms of community. For example, millions of people have a guest bedroom, or a, a granny flat, as it would be called. So what I could do is a work exchange. I don't need to own my own house. If they have a bedroom, again, I could cook, I could garden, I could watch the children. There's all sorts of things that I could do to meet those basic needs, even as I'm a much older person than, than I am today. As I've said, I don't have any financial savings. No retirement, you know, no, no 401k or Roth IRAs or anything like that. But I do have savings. I believe that by taking care of the world around me, by living in the service of others, that other people will also be here for me. I believe that if I dedicate decades of my life to humanity, to other species, that people will take care of me. So you could call that social capital. That's a term that's used. Uh, you could call that creating community. And that's a belief that I have. I believe that we can take care of each other. So I truly, truly believe that my savings is the relationships that I create. My security is the relationships that I create with other people, with the earth, understanding the world that I live on, understanding the resources that this earth has and how to properly, properly utilize them. I truly, I have faith in humanity. I have faith that I will be taken care of in a time of need, but not in a way that I'm taking from others, but in a way where I've given and other people will give to me. And I don't think in a linear fashion, I give you this, you give me this. It can be completely circular. I don't have to have necessarily helped this person over here for that person to help me because we're all helping each other and it comes and it goes. So, you know, some people have a really hard time receiving. Myself, I have a harder time receiving than giving. But we have to be able to receive. We have to be able to work together as a community. And again, that's my savings. That's my security. I don't believe that retirement funds, I don't believe that necessarily owning the house, uh, I don't believe that health insurance, I don't believe having a million dollars in the bank, that any of that is necessarily secure in the world that we live in. And we've seen plenty of examples of that. Security for me is the relationships that I create with humans and with the, with the earth that I live on. I am just 33 years old, so in some ways I'm not, or I'm not the best messenger to talk about death. I'm young and I'm healthy and I haven't experienced near death and I'm not just, you know, work, whittling away my last years on earth, maybe wanting to get every year out of it. So I'm not the best messenger, but I am going to talk about it a little bit because, well, I'm going to die and we're all going to die. I have a very different take on death than I did 10 years ago, let's say. And what's been interesting about my life is that the biggest lessons don't necessarily come in ways that you expect them. And the changes that you, do, you make don't necessarily create the ripples that you expect or ultimately the big waves. I've been simplifying my life and downsizing for eight years now. And I have simplified my life to an extreme. It's an extreme. Again, what I'm doing is extreme. The thing about the way that I've simplified my life is it's created a feeling of impermanence. I've designed my whole life around impermanence. My goal is to die with almost nothing. And that when I do die, there's almost nothing to do. There's not accounts to deal with. There's not houses. There's not possessions to split up. When I die, memories exist. The impact that I've made exists, but I'm just gone. I return to the earth. That's, you know, that's one of my ultimate, most important goals in life is to die with almost nothing. Because I have no very little money and no bank accounts and no possessions, the interesting thing is that that idea of permanence 
is very much real. I have become to understand my impermanence so much better than I ever could have imagined. Get rid, getting rid of items and losing the material you know, desire for things has made me embrace my impermanence and be okay with the fact that I'm going to die. Again, I'm 33, I'm young and healthy, so I'm not the greatest messenger of this. Only time will be able to prove, only, only time will tell. Only as I age will these philosophies be able to see whether I actually practice them and put them to, to full use. Only time will tell that. I'll be interested, maybe you'll still be with me and you'll, you'll see. And I truly believe that with the amount of intention that I've put into my life that I will continue to live out these philosophies. One thing that I didn't mention about health insurance that goes along with death is there are scenarios that I have chosen that I wouldn't choose medical intervention. I personally will not get chemo. If I have something that is likely for me to die within a period of years, I'm not going to have hundreds of thousands of dollars and vast amounts of resources used to keep me alive. That is my personal will, my personal desire, and, and my personal belief. I believe that death is okay, and I've come to accept that much more than I had in the past and, and much more than my society that I'm surrounded by does. Now, I again am the 33-year-old messenger, but you don't have to look to me for these. You can look at the many cultures that exist around the world outside of my very young culture and see that many, many cultures embrace death. They honor it. They do not fear death. They understand that death is as much of a part of life as birth. That's the bigger picture reality. Death has to happen. And I actually go a little further. And I believe that our desire to hang on to every last year is what is in many ways killing humanity and possibly taking life from future generations. It's a vast majority of all of our health care goes into the last few years of human life. And I believe that that amount of resources that we're putting into that may be taking the years from future generations because of the way that we hold on to all of that. That's not easy for me to deliver that message and I'm sure it's not easy to hear and a lot of people you know, might not like that, but that is something that I think is really worth thinking about. It's if we value life, do we value other life as much as our own that's on earth now and do we value future life as much as we do our, our own? And I'm trying to design my life around the true value of life, not just my own. So that was a lot. And uh, I'm really happy to have been able to spend the time and share with you, share this with you. Of course, it's not everything. I fit a lot into this short time that we have together here in this video. And there's a lot more. So on my website, I write in more depth and there's resources for my thoughts on health insurance and age and death. There's my public will. There's my financial transparency. There's my vows, um, information about e income and where it comes from and where it goes. All that information is on my website and all of those links are in the description of this video. So I hope that this time together uh, has been beneficial to you and that you've gained some insight that you've gained some inspiration, that you feel a level of empowerment to live the life that you want and live in a way that your actions are in alignment with your beliefs. And if that's the case, then I hope that you'll share this video with people that you think it could benefit. Um, I hope that you'll like it and hit that uh, thumbs up in order to, to spread this video and get it out there across YouTube. And if you have questions, Definitely comment. I'll try to answer most questions um, and, and explain things that you might be wondering about. Let me know your perspective as well. And if you haven't yet, definitely subscribe because there'll be many more videos to come. So I wish you all a very happy, healthy life and I love you all very much.